How's that? Well, thanks everyone for coming. It's great to be here. This first poem I'm going to read has a lot of high-minded references, but it's not a high-minded poem. I don't write those kinds of things. And so I'm going to get through those and then read it out. Dendrology, that's the study of trees. There are some Latin names for trees in the poem. Malden's, this little town section in, in England, uh, was the site of a famous battle. We might have studied that in Anglo-Saxon literature, the Battle of Malden. Où sont les neiges d'antan? is a French reference to a 14th century poem. I think it means, where have gone the snows of yesteryear? What happened to the great times of old kind of thing? Uh, there's references to lots of poets, a very heady, heady references here. <laughs> Tintinabulations, that's from Poe. Poem, Unferth was Beowulf's uh, antagonist. He shows up. <laughs> and that's the poem. No, I'm only kidding. Um, I just want to thank Tom and Travis and everyone else involved in, in this reading series. I mean, it's just quite an amazing thing. My, my teacher, Adam Zagievsky, read um, a couple years ago. It was just wonderful to come and see him. And just the, the kind of cultural work that these guys do, bringing poetry to Atlanta and exposing more and more people to this great craft, this incredible art form. And, you know, it's, it's really the greatest, most important art form in the world, science fiction aside. <laughs> Here's the first poem. <laughs> Poetry is stupid. <laughs> I was majoring in dendrology and girls, failing both. So when my hated roommate burst into English class, slammed down his book bag and declared, Poetry is stupid, it does nothing for the world, I knew I'd found my calling. <laughs> One look at his composition, scrawled in red like a field at Malden, I smirked and hit the stacks, came back loaded down. Milton, Dickinson, Auden, Rich. He whined for days, calling the teacher idiot, bitch, recounting his unbroken string of high school A's. Où sont les neiges d'antan? <laughs> I despised his loafers, Izod shirts, smooth persuasion of hair, and envied with a numbing ache the queue of beauties he ushered in, cueing me with a nod to beat it. I'd slump off to the student center, pour through howl, Homeric hymns, repeating the mantra beneath my breath, poetry is stupid. Second term, I traded Pinus Nigra for Robert Frost, Catalpa Speciosa for Sexton and Plath, and slowly, as Middle Pennsylvania thawed, the notebooks filled. Tonight I lose my birth weight in sweat alone, sip the matter of my fall in rye, chew the cattle's flesh, spin like a spider the lace of verse. Recitation vexed the jerk. Cut that shit, he'd snap, from his annex two-thirds of our space. <laughs> Rumor has it he made a killing in the dot-com boom. They say he even clanged the bell one morning at the stock exchange, gross tintinabulations. In my mind's eye, though, I place him in a smaller scene, purchasing a birthday gift for his wife, the third. He browses down the wrong aisle in a Barnes and Noble, and spotting my name along one spine, double takes and says out loud, hey, I room with that hand job freshman year. <laughs> then he cracks the slender volume, peruses till he finds the poem, this poem, dedicated to none other than him my adversary, my antonym, my unferth, my muse. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't mean to say, I didn't mean to elicit applause with that. Thank you, that was kind of weird. <laughs> but you can applaud after every poem, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, all right, that was from my second book. I read a poem from my first book. Coward. There's a coward in every eavesdropper. I never realized that until one summer night, the trucker who lived next door steered his rig up the gravel drive home from the long hall to work over his wife. Through the hum of the window fan, I heard a crash of glass, the splintered sound of a busted chair, and lay in bed alone, praying it would stop, 
listening to her body being thrown against hard lock. I knew that doing nothing is always doing something, and that nothing in this case was something hurtful to a woman getting her share just then. I reached for the bedstand phone. What I didn't know was this, that nothing was going to make it stop, that in a minute I'd be setting the receiver back undialed, telling the part of myself that suddenly needed to hear it, how I should mind my own business, it wasn't my fault. There were hotlines, shelters, she should call, leave the monster. Trying not to listen, rips of cloth, a muffled cry, yet straining still to hear, I began to wonder what could lead a man to this, a road paved with what? The constant smack of bugs on windshield glass, dead without knowing what hit them, the air just stopping short. The double yellow line at night blurred to a single stream, like a piss held in painfully, then suddenly let loose in Tulsa or Des Moines, with a grind of the same 12 gears up and down, over and over, a form of butchery in itself. Some dishes broke and I couldn't take it anymore, pulled a pillow over my head. Hemorrhoids, back trouble, the threat of jackknifing in the rain. After, I thought I heard her on the stoop, mumbling words of, could it possibly have been shame? It sounded like shame, but now I know that was only me throwing my voice. Next morning, the rig was gone. Out on the turnpike, its chrome front end beating down the distance, knocking the wind out of the nation again. My neighbor stood on her porch, studying the hedges, gemmed with dew between our lots. I opened the door, bent for the newspaper, glanced her way. Her face was a map he'd drawn to guide him back to the crappy little town inside himself, that hellhole without a sheriff or a name, population one or zero, hard to say. She looked at me and smiled, the kind of polite smile that instead of opening a bridge holds up a sign that reads, in essence, closed for repairs. The hollows of her eyes told me that of all the things he'd beaten out of her, it was the hope that things might change that hurt the worst. I wanted to show compassion, say something kind, prove all men weren't scum. That was before I'd learned how worthless consolation is, comforting those in anguish less than those in awkward loss for any truly helpful words. A school bus rumbled past, screeched to a halt at the end of the block, inhaled some kids. I watched until it pulled away making sure the driver took the corner wide enough, missed the curb. No, 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 no. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> always bring your mother to poetry reading. It means always one person in the crowd will like it. This poem I read in honor of the Paper Making Technology Museum. <laughs> it's about paper and books and relationships and all that other cool, difficult, wonderful stuff. You guys know what silver fishes are? Those little bugs that kind of you know, destroy a book? That's the title of this poem, Silverfish. This one too, lots of heady references. I don't know about that in, in my poetry, but lots of po poets mentioned here. But a love poem. Silverfish. Pressed between print, haunting gutters, we traded closeness for dialogue and plot, dropped concordantly to sleep not long before dawn, Hardbacks propped on our chest like tents on a plane in Cooper. Wingless, piscatorial, we dined on starches and molds, slid into cracks, crevices, bathtubs on occasion. Troubled to escape their slick, enameled palisades, we chose the horizontal, leaves of grass in lounge chairs by the pool, Ginsburg on blow-up rafts. Our rooms, bibliographic amphitheaters thronged with titled spines. The Odyssey, The Frogs, selected poems by John Crow Ransom. We burrowed in Wolf, Nod Updike, and Austin, all of whom declared the first sorrow can be lifted but not hauled off, a theme we paid too little notice, 
paying ransom to it as we were for and with our lives. During famine, we attacked the leatherware, fine-bound collector's copies. Naturally, we considered children nymphs, creatures of liquid and myth. The decades passed since last we kissed. Were we mistaken to embrace or simply overtaken by aversions to the real? One time, in a viscid afternoon, no one but us recalls, I climbed the broken back of a sweet gum tree while you snapped photos, unmindful of your thumb obscuring the lens. One can block a part of the heart, you know. You know, Lapisma saccharina, sweet tooth, old friend of sizing and glue. Thankfully, the damage we did commensurate with our kind was slight, minor foxing of silks and rayon. Yet sometimes I think we might have flourished had we canoed the Susquehanna or submitted to the bombs of church. Studious, antenna raised, we sought protection and exacted meaning, forced our minds to mind and called the act reflection. It didn't help. Lost in light motifs, humidities of simmering conflict, we came to begrudge the characters we consumed, their crafted shapeliness, perfect aim at fate. Who could blame us in our supple exoskeletons, lank appendages, we had to part. Like every paradise, ideal companionship exists purely on the page, is the page, here for old times, feed on this. Thanks, Dad. And I thought I'd read a couple new poems. I think there are a couple little funny parts in the second one. I'm not really sure, but the first one's just earnest as can be. <laughs> Stuffy. Serious. Oh, that was a pun. The stuff. The night he swerved his Volvo into a gully and dialed me up for help, I drove out ready to shove him into the mud slick ditch, call him a reckless ass, and spit in his face what I knew he knew far better than any midnight friend, that the stuff was going to kill him sooner than later, maybe someone else, maybe a family as well. But when at last I found him off Highway 5, chilled and apologetic, under a moth-eaten blanket of sky, I couldn't bring myself even to scoff or shake my head. He seemed so small, far off, as if seen through a telescope turned backwards, and he was my mentor, let's not forget. We stood for a minute in silence, he swaying pine-like, me looking down the road for cops, then into the muscled distance of Black Hills. I could hear the wind leaf nervously through its books, searching on my behalf for a timely piece of wisdom that might miraculously cure the man if only axioms weren't dead white males. I don't know, he slurred, how to thank you. And I came this close to saying quit, but only cracked a smile, one meant to make me appear too worldly wise to judge. In fact, I was thinking judgmentally about the beer that made him grabby, wine that drew out song, and the bourbon with its taste of sun-bleached leather tightening the belt. And earlier, I lied. I drove out ready to bust him once sharply in the teeth to watch blood, not more regrets, trickle from his mouth. Wasn't that the mouth that told me I could do anything with my life, anything on the page? Hadn't he suggested in a poem of his own that our spirits are so radiant they throw shadows of flesh and bone? Really, he said, I mean it, but I could hardly hear him. Already I was on my back, keeping my hands moving with the chains, hooking them to the frames underneath our bumpers, working to pull him free. Last poem, The Theft. No high-minded references. <laughs> 
unless you consider ramen noodles a high-minded <laughs> reference. Magic marker, maybe. <laughs> the theft. A few weeks into my first semester at the Central Pennsylvania College I would party myself out of in less than a year, I stole my roommate's girlfriend with a kiss one cold, starless night outside our dorm, or put more truly, she threw a leg across and borrowed me like an unchained bike to ride away from him. <laughs> Even though she dropped me, too, not long after, or let's say she leaned me gently against a tree, <laughs> it bothers me to this day that he packed for the family farm, never to return. Some nights I lie awake and think of him behind the wheel, sky the color of denim, horses in the distance, grazing on the distance, how he must have cursed me every mile from school to home. Her name was Judy, his Eric, I can't remember mine. I can bring back only the ramen noodles stacked higher than books on our shelves, the guitar I picked at all the time, a musical scab, and his scuffed up golf set in the corner he tried out and made the team with ease. He wrote asshole in magic marker on my leather satchel before he left, and of course I couldn't blame him, but blamed him nonetheless, telling the guys on the floor what a naive fool he was, a stupid farm boy, until he entered our collective memory, then our communal forgetting. Judy, I have no doubt, runs a law firm now, her dark eyes set on justice, and some nights when sleep won't come, I think of Eric as a tall, thick-wristed kid just out of high school who could drive a tractor, track a deer, and knock a golf ball farther than any man in his county. In my dream for him, he keeps his feelings locked up for years inside a cabin in the woods, but lets them out at last, stunned and blinking. When he meets the perfect woman, what would you say, working the ticket booth at a summer fair? But other nights, when dreams won't do, I fear he married, within a month, the girl he brought to the high school prom. They get on fine, steadily, if blandly, raise some kids, until the day the vision returns, and Eric sees himself in the second story window, looking down on Judy and me, leaning in. That's when, in disgust, he bites his lip, throws a hand in the air, dismissing his wife and children, the life he's built, with the gesture of a golfer tossing up a pinch of grass to test the inclination of the wind. Thank you.